Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today to the, I don't even know which number it is, but to one of the webinars of the Social Scientists Against the Hostile Environment. Um, we've been holding these webinars on a regular basis since the uh, early summer, I'd say. Uh, on a range of topics. Today's seminar is going to be about the politics of social reproduction, migration, and the hostile environment during the pandemic. Um, it's going to be chaired by myself, Umut Erel, and my colleague, Rachel Rosen. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then um, chair the first part and the second part with your questions is going to be chaired by Rachel. If you have questions and comments, please put them in the chat box. That's how we're going to have our Q&A session or discussion session. Um, and we've asked our speakers to be very disciplined and speak for 10 to 15 minutes. And the reason for that is that we're hoping to have enough time for a, um, for, for an exchange, really, and uh, give everybody a, a chance to, uh, to contribute with their comments and questions. So I'm not going to talk for very long, but what I will do is I'll introduce our three speakers for today, all to start with. So our first speaker is going to be Yasmin Gunaratnam. She's a reader in sociology at Goldsmiths College, University of London. She's widely written in the areas of disability, gender and sexuality, health and illness, migration, methodologies and race. And for her, the understanding and challenging of inequality and injustice is at the heart of her research. A long-standing interest is in how inequality can be normalized, how it impacts on bodies and minds, and how it is resisted and informs both the content, and that informs both the content and methods of her work that interest. Today, she'll be speaking to the uh, international and transnational aspects of social reproduction and solidarity. And um, her title is The Violence That Sustains Us, Plantations, Care, and the Pandemic. Our second speaker is going to be Gwyneth Lonergan. She is research fellow in sociology at Lancaster University, and her research interests are in citizenship and migration. In particular, she's looking at the intersection of neoliberalism, race, and gender, and how this influences the construction of citizenship and the material experience of citizenship. She's also interested in reproductive justice and the relationship between state policies on reproduction and immigration controls and social movements, particularly urban social movements and those centered on migration. Her title today is going to be Migrant Women, Reproductive Justice and the Hostile Environment during the COVID pandemic. And our third speaker um, is Sarah Ferris. Sarah is senior lecturer in sociology at Goldsmith College, University of London, and her work has focused on the orientalist underpinnings of sociological theory and on theories of gender, race, and social reproduction, particularly as they apply to the analysis of migrant women in Western Europe. She's examined theories of racism and nationalism, the specific gendered forms of orientalist representation of women in Western public discourse, the mobilization of women's rights by right-wing nationalist parties within xenophobic campaigns, which she terms female nationalism, and the commodification of care and social reproduction and its links to processes of racialization, as well as the dialogue between intersectional theory and Marxist feminisms. And her title today is Social Reproduction in the Times of a Pandemic. But let me first pass to, um, to Yasmin now and her talk on the violence that sustains us, plantations, care, and the pandemic. Um, 
No. Um, Nando or Ben, could you unmute Yasmin? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I must admit I was a bit surprised when I got the email from Nira. Um, so I guess if you're a bit puzzled about why I'm part of this panel today, I thought I'd, um, and because time is short, I thought I'd try and portray some of that through three scenes. Um, but just by way of background, my understanding of social reproduction is a distributed system of life support. So let me try and do hostile environments, care and plantations in three scenes. Scene one, somewhere in a children's playground in South London a very, very long time ago. Where are you from? Ceylon. Where's that? You know, where all the tea comes from. Scene two is from my three Jagavasans ethnography of Tamil workers in Sri Lanka, which is called Tea and Solidarity. It's a really good book, <laughs> quick plug for my three there. Um, and there's a scene in the book where my three is with the artist Hanusha Soma Sundaran Sundaram. And Sundaram was born on a, a plantation and they're looking at and talking about a work of art that was entitled Stain Two. And this work of art consists of six teacups and inside each cup is an ink drawing of different aspects of plantation life. And each cup had a sort of a small, you know, those um, dangly bits of string with a label on them that we're so used to seeing in some forms of tea. And Jagetherson writes, on the label attached to the cup, feature the cup featuring the pregnant woman giving birth were the following words. Pregnant woman, labor, risk, income, why? Why for me is a really beautiful condensing and materializing of labor, um, which for me resonates with, it's not quite the same, but Christina Sharp's idea of wake work, which is staying, and Christina Sharp's particularly thinking of slavery, but this notion of staying in the wake of and trying to make visible and hold to account the ongoingness of violence in the past, in, in the present. So scene three, um, earlier this year, the Sri Lankan women-led plantation union, Red Flag, sent me a research report of three, from three um, estates they'd been working with, three tea plantation estates. And the report was called Shame and Blame. And the report included several testimonies of what daily life is like for the women who pluck our tea. So in many plantations, there aren't toilet facilities when the women are on their shifts. So they have to use the tea bushes as toilets. They're often bitten by leeches, really horrible wasps. A wasp isn't quite the word, uh, it's, it's not quite the word for uh, what these animal, these insects are. Um, they're much bigger and the effects are much worse than the wasps we have in, in this side of the globe. And they're bitten by snakes. There's also the effects of fertilizers on women and children's health in tea plantations and much, much more. And there are just a couple of the stories from that report that I want to highlight. So the first one says, during pregnancy, I need to drink a lot of water but there wasn't, that wasn't possible because I would have to go to the toilet many times. So I stopped drinking water. One day I was bitten by a snake when I went to the jungle to relieve myself and it affected my newborn baby also. So not only my health, my income too. The second story, when fertilizer is being applied in the fields, workers are told 
to eat early as the food may get contaminated. But just after the fertilizer is sprayed on, on the next day itself, we start working with the smell of chemical spray, breathing the polluted air. So I hope with those three scenes, you'll see something of the flows between plantation products, migration in my own case. So my mother and father came here from Sri Lanka in the 1960s to work for the National Health Service. Again, a front line that's been really exposed in terms of its racialization during the pandemic. And also the lives that we're obliged to forget. So this really reminds me of what Achille Mbembe has taught us, that slavery and colonialism actually birthed biopolitics, so a very different starting point than Michel Foucault. So a biopolitics is the power to govern who lives and who dies. And it did this by turning human beings into commodities via racial thinking. So it invented a machinery of racial thinking it stole lands and it created ongoing um, environmental catastrophe. So this is some of the work, you know, that was done in the 1970s um, by um, Crosby in terms of um, how colonialism also involved the exchange of microorganisms and plants and animals and, and how devastating that was to indigenous people. Um, so there's what I really want to think of in, to, in terms of colonialism and these global chains of production is the governing of different areas of life. And I think it's really interesting that recently black feminist thought has seen a geologizing of political life. So Christina Sharp's use, for example, of weathering to connote the slow wearing down of, of black bodies and then there's also cosmological life and death too. And all of this is global, but it's also very intimate. It's literally within our own bodies. So most of you here, I would think, have been having plantation products today, maybe sitting right beside you now. Um, so there's something really submerged and ghostly about these relationships that became more visible for me during the lockdown. So I too have been gliding along on infrastructures of, of the plantation um, that only came to light for me very starkly during the pandemic um, in the UK when I was noticing how people were getting really important sustenance from what I've been thinking of as plantation pleasures. So tea, coffee, cocoa, sugar, um, as well as in the urgent calls for PPE for our essential workers. So, you know, just thinking about the rubber that goes into PPE and where that com comes from. And around this time, the red flag trade union was also lobbying the government in Sri Lanka to ensure pandemic protections for um, tea workers, they were exempt from the curfew at that time, so they were forced to work. Um, at the same time, so plantation economies feed into other precarious economies. And Menaha Kandasamy, who's the leader of, who was uh, the leader of the Red Flag Union, it's very unusual, I should say, to have a woman-led trade union in plantations. So she set that up union up and she also set up the domestic workers union so what were the links there well when I sort of asked her about this she said it very evocatively that plantations are wombs of domestic work so plantation workers because the conditions and pay are so bad so last year, Sri Lankan worker, plantation workers held strikes and demonstrations where they were demanding um, a thousand rupees a day. And they didn't get that. So they get about 700 rupees a day, which is about three pounds, I would think. And if you're feeling a bit sort of righteous in terms of, you know, you only buy um, ethically in terms of tea, Reuters had a report that came out last year that showed that 
a lot of et ethical tea actually when they followed it back to plantations still has still doesn't pay the workers enough so for me there was something really important in this and thinking about how plantation communities have always been in a way locked down so plantations are very sort of cut off socially and geographically and um I was reminded of the work of the late A.A. Sivanandan. So when I first started studying sociology, there were so few Sri Lankan scholars around and he was someone who I owe a huge intellectual debt to. I think we all do. But he called plantations colonies within colonies. So in thinking about these different connections to the, I think the pandemics really partially expose plantation regimes and what feminist theorists like Donna Haraway and Anna Singh have called the era of the plantation scene. And I've wanted to think about how we might re-imagine our front lines, I guess, in terms of time and space. And Titi Bhattacharya has really pointed out in terms of social reproduction theory, how the relays in, within capitalism between spheres of reproduction and production are very um, imbricated. So let me just be more concrete. I think our relationships in the global north with plantations is mainly through unthinking consumption, but also what Jasbir Puar has called debility. And again, this is the idea of the slow wearing away of people. Um, so in tea plantations, I'm thinking about the high levels of um, women's malnutrition and child malnutrition um, and various health conditions, injuries, pain, all of which is not recognized as disability as such. And so there are these bodily losses that Elizabeth Pobanelli, who's a feminist philosopher and with the help of Hannah Arant thinks through as the earth and the worlds of food and toilet. So food and toilet are literally in plantation lives and this is how our hostile environments actually change material existence for some people. Um, I'm aware I'm coming up to time so I think um, just in terms of my final ideas about this, I've wanted to think of front lines and social reproduction through different temporalities in that what I saw in the pandemic is what was that our front lines here in terms of particularly racialized and migrant healthcare workers and also in terms of the goods that we consume give time and in terms of those front lines actually we can use them as a time device to think about how our front lines stand between us and different forms of debility and death. Um, so yeah the other thing I wanted to say is that colonialism, colonialism's always kind of operated through trying to produce the global north as a protected biosphere and I've been really interested how the coronavirus in this sort of skipping across of the virus from the wet markets in Wuhan across the globe has really both kind of shattered and exposed um, some of the workings of colonialism through this idea of a protected biosphere. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for for really important and incisive contribution. Um, without further ado, I'll be giving the word to Gwyneth, Gwyneth Lonergan, who's going to talk about migrant women, reproductive justice and the hostile environment during the COVID pandemic. And she also has a visual presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just sharing the screen. Hopefully this will work. Excellent. 
Okay, so thank you very much the organizers for, for inviting me and also to the other speakers. Uh, I really enjoyed your, your talk very much, Yasmin. Um, so yes, this uh, discussion uh, talk is about migrant women reproductive justice in the hostile environment during the COVID pandemic. And it draws on research I did as a PhD student and also my current project looking at migrant women's experiences of maternity care in three areas in the north of England and also uh, my experience as an active activist in migrant rights activism and reproductive justice. So the US-based Women of Color Collective Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the right to have children, not have children, and to parent the children we have in a safe and sustainable communities. The concept itself was developed by US women of color following their meetings with feminists from the global south at the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo. But the underpinning ideas and critique have been present in the writings and activism around reproductive justice of women of color in the United States, black British feminists, and feminists from the global south since the 1970s. Uh, for example, the Kambahi River Collective, whose um, famous statement was published among other places in this collect, um, in this, uh, anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, as well as the Organization of Women of Asian and African Descent uh, in the UK. And you can see here some excerpts from one of their newsletters in which they discuss uh, the campaign against Deepo Provera. The reproductive justice essentially critiques the liberal underpinnings of reproductive choice. It asks us, what does it mean to say that you have a choice because abortion is legal, for example, if you lack the resources to properly effectuate that choice? Do you really have the choice to have children if you can't afford to feed them? The reproductive justice framework highlights that, that genuine biological reproductive autonomy requires adequate state and social support for social reproduction practices. And I have a long-standing interest in thinking about the relationship between social reproduction, biological reproduction, and immigration controls, including the hostile environment. So I think that using the reproductive justice lens, we can see that the hostile environment poses a serious threat to migrant women's reproductive autonomy. Indeed, I would argue that disciplining migrant women's reproductive practices is one of the key functions of the hostile environment. It's striking that the hostile environment functions in significant part in and through sites critical to biological and social reproduction, for example, hospital and letting agencies. The hostile environment can discipline migrant women's reproductive autonomy by restricting access to the resources necessary for biological and social reproduction. This may involve a straightforward denial of resources. So for example, pregnant asylum seekers whose uh, claim have failed can be left destitute. But also we can see in policy documents around the charging regime in the NHS depicts pregnant migrants as posing a particular threat to the NHS and being a group that is uh, in particular is seen as using the NHS illicitly. We can also see a situation where the hostile uh, environment restricts or rations resources in order to produce particular sorts of reproductive behavior. In particular, uh, under neoliberalism, uh, trying to ensure that migrants only have babies that they can quote unquote afford. Uh, a really good example of this is the family migration rules. Basically, I'm sure everyone here aware of how the family migration rules work, but you have to, in order to apply for the visa and then renew it after two and a half years, and then apply for indefinite relief to remain after five years, you have to show at each point that you make a certain income and the income increases if you have one or more children. So of course, that would be the sort of thing you have to take in consideration when planning your family. And in my current research project, I have spoken to one woman so far who did plan her family around the family migration rules and having to reapply for a spousal visa and wanting to make sure that her family income would meet the minimum. Now, in this analysis, I'm drawing on a great deal of scholarship, uh, including scholarship done by many of the people present today, including Nera Yuval Davis and Uma Durrell, uh, that looks at the way in which migrant women's reproductive practices, both biological and social, have been constructed as threatening the nation state. Women are constructed as responsible for reproducing the collectivity, and as outsiders, migrant women are suspected of being unable or unwilling to raise so-called good future citizens. And this can be especially true of migrant women who are maybe constructed as threatening 
uh, for other reasons. So women from racialized groups, especially, uh, and under neoliberalism, women who are considered insufficiently responsible or economically productive. And COVID has definitely exacerbated the hostile environment impact on reproductive justice in many ways. Um, I'm sure we're all paying attention to the question of uh, the health levies going up by 234 pounds since October. Um, there's been discussion about whether or not NHS uh, workers should be exempt from it, but clearly in a situation where work has become more precarious and where many paid positions involve actually exposing yourself to COVID, the need to be able to earn enough money to pay for these visa fees is like a significant uh, problem. In addition, evictions from asylum housing have restarted. But I think it's really critical to acknowledge that the hostile environment has long been resisted by migrant activists and their allies. And questions around support for social reproduction and by extension reproductive justice have long been central to this activism. Key findings from my PhD research uh, included that migrant support organizations, including migrant self-help organizations, were critical in allowing migrants to survive and resist the hostile environment. So this involved, first of all, providing material resources, both in terms of actually providing direct support, but also enabling migrants to get state resources to which they were entitled. Um, so for example, there was quite a lot of work uh, being done by migrants to help other migrants overcome invisible barriers like language difficulties or a lack of understanding about the system. Um, there are two quotes here from my THD research. Um, the first from Judy, a European migrant activist in Manchester, and the second from Iris, a refugee activist in Sheffield. And in both cases, they're talking about how uh, their organizations or them personally would meet with migrants and help them access welfare state resources by helping them filling out, fill out the appropriate forms, especially if those forms were in English and the um, migrants in question struggled with English or didn't understand how to answer the forms. Or in Iris's case, often by accompanying women to the GP, to the job center, uh, and basically sometimes acting as an interpreter, but more often just acting as an advocate and helping people understand how they can access these resources, but also making sure that the GP and the job center and other people were following the law and providing adequate support. Another key finding was that the emotional resources and support provided by migrant self-help organizations were really critical. I think it's important to recognize that the hostile environment is meant to be emotionally draining. The, I, in my opinion, asylum seekers and precarious migrants are intentionally isolated by the hostile environment uh, in order to make their lives uncomfortable and persuade them to leave the country. Uh, I think a really good example of this is the bar and asylum seekers working. It makes no sense from an economic point of view, but it makes a lot of sense if you're trying to make sure that asylum seekers can't go to work and form the kind of relationships and support that might make it more difficult for the government to deport them later. And so here we have a quote from Nora, who's an asylum seeker in Manchester, who's talking about the importance of emotional support uh, for her ongoing survival and, and her activism. Many of the migrants I worked with also recognized that new mothers uh, were doubly burdened, that not only are migrants, uh, are asylum seekers and migrants often socially isolated, but new migrants, uh, new mothers were also often socially isolated as well. So here's a quote, another quote from Judy, talking about why she felt it was necessary to set up a support group for mothers where she lived. Um, similarly, Iris had actually uh, founded a mother and baby group in her area that was specifically uh, targeted at supporting migrant mothers and babies and helping the babies and toddlers be ready for school. I think it's fair to say that if you're new in a country, preparing uh, your child for school can be really challenging. I've lived in the UK for 10 years. My daughter is about to go into secondary school and I'm constantly asking my husband to explain GCSEs to me again. My current research with migrant, in my current research, migrant mothers similarly talk about the importance of family and friend support networks, some of which were formed through contact with migrant support organizations. And all of this, I think, should be understood as a reproductive justice issue. 
that these women require material and emotional resources to, in order to have a proper choice to extent that a proper choice can ever exist. But the social distancing measures required by the pandemic have impacted the support for social reproduction and by extension reproductive justice from community groups, although these community groups are doing their best and continue to operate under very difficult circumstances. It's much harder to undertake many of these activities remotely rather than in person. If you go back to the example of uh, Iris's activities of actually accompanying people and serving as their advocate, she can't do that anymore because she needs to remain uh, socially distanced. Language barriers and the digital divide are uh, a really big problem here. One group I've been involved with for a long time has gotten a grant to uh, give its members additional cash so that they can pay for data on their phone and continue to participate at their drop-in. But I've personally observed at these drop-ins that the numbers have dropped precipitously since the start of the pandemic. There's also been significantly increased social isolation as a result of this. And I think it is important to think about what that will mean to migrants, especially new mothers. So basically to conclude, reproductive justice requires among other things, adequate state support for social reproduction. The hostile environment can be read as disciplining migrant women's reproductive practices by limiting or placing conditions on their access to the state support. Migrant women and their allies have resisted this exclusion, but the pandemic and the distancing required has made this resistance much more difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gwyneth, for a very, uh, very important also, and um, uh, yeah, very important contribution. I'm going to pass now straight to Sarah Faris, um, our third and last speaker, who is going to talk to the title of social reproduction in the times of a pandemic. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, clearly, thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, this is such an important topic um, and discussion really. And today I want to, I thought that I would um, base this presentation on an article and a research that I did recently uh, with Mark Bergfeld, who actually is the, um, he's not an academic, he's uh, the director of the Global Union, the CARE Union that um, works specifically with care workers. And just a few months ago, we decided to, to write together this article to discuss the ways in which uh, um, this pandemic was actually showing a quite uh, um, unusual, uh, I would say, phenomenon, particularly in the, during the first wave. Uh, as I, I will tell later, I think um, in some ways uh, things have shift, shifted and have changed more recently, but it was nonetheless quite interesting for us to note there was a kind of reversal, a reversal, if you remember, especially at the beginning, a reversal in the way in which uh, uh, we were thinking collectively as a society uh, of the traditional hierarchy in the division of labor. Uh, that's also why we called our article the COVID-19 pandemic and the end of the low-skilled worker. Uh, so you, you obviously you remember um, we spent the first months of the pandemic everywhere really in Europe. Uh, just uh, celebrating and praising uh, uh, care workers, but also supermarket employees uh, uh, or uh, cleaners. Uh, uh, in short, all those workers that usually did not receive uh, a claim that were uh, even uh, socially stigmatized, uh, uh, have a very low pay, no one really wants to do those jobs, etc. And suddenly, all these uh, jobs and all these professions were considered as essential. And so with Mark, we were really wondering what's going on here? How is that uh, these low skilled jobs uh, uh, suddenly have uh, such a public attention? And obviously, we know the reason we they were uh, in absolutely necessary. Uh, our societies could simply not do without those jobs and with uh, without those people doing those jobs. So we decided really 
uh, to start looking into this category, which is low skill. What does it mean? Uh, what, what does it mean when a job, when a profession is conceived and defined as low skilled? Uh, what does it entail? What does it mean in terms of, we are used to thinking of that in terms of training, of the, uh, the, the training and the education that goes uh, into that kind of profession. But at the end of the day, the reality is that this just doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't stand. And as uh, we were increasingly looking at how these uh, categories uh, and these definitions of low skill, high skill, uh, have really nothing to do with skills uh, at all, but everything to do with what uh, uh, the system we live under, which is called the capitalism, and especially neoliberal capitalism, uh, has defined and, uh, uh, and thought of a certain jobs as uh, at the top, as the skilled jobs, because those are the jobs that enable profit making, and all the other jobs that in one way or another are, are less prone to enable this profit making system as instead uh, low skill. Um, one of the things that uh, also I, I revisited when we were working on, on this article and we were, when we were thinking about uh, the, all these connections was also the work of the late David Graeber, uh, who uh, spoke of the bullshit jobs. And so a few years ago, maybe you are familiar with, with these definitions, he wrote this book, which was all about uh, basically discussing how our societies especially our advanced capitalist Western societies, are so much based on jobs, tasks, profession that either in themselves or at least parts of them are entirely pointless. That's why he talked of, of bullshit jobs. And the examples he makes are the, now from memory, the telemarketeer, uh, the, um, uh, the the corporate lawyer, uh, the um, which one was the other one? The door attendants. Uh, so all jobs that he said, some of them just uh, the only use they have is to make uh, uh, the, the rich people or the other owner of a certain uh, practice as does they make them feel important, but they have absolutely no other use. And what was interesting for us in, uh, uh, during the pandemic was to see that uh, the reality of those bullshit jobs was in front of everyone's eyes, uh, precisely because uh, uh, those jobs that had been traditionally stigmatized and considered low skills, uh, where they were in fact the essential jobs. And uh, uh, all those that instead had constant pay rises, they were considered as a socially desirable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we in fact learned that we could easily do without them. Now, what does this have to do with uh, social reproduction? Um, now, I understand the social reproduction uh, as uh, I would say a broad, very broad church, a broad set of theories, uh, and concepts that uh, mostly maintain that uh, um, that labor and social reproduct socially reproductive labor is uh, needed with that labor that is needed to reproduce uh, life, uh, labor power, and uh, society more in general. So this type of labor, which we call a socially uh, reproductive labor, stands in a necessary but at the same time contradictory relationship with capitalism, with this system that is profit, which, which is based on, on profit making. So why contradictory? Well, on the one hand, and here I am as well basing myself in these reflections on the work of Titi Bhattacharya, but also Eleanor Kaufman, who I, I, I saw in, uh, in the audience and other scholars, uh, uh, who in fact have made this analysis and explained how, on the one hand, the capitalism badly needs uh, these uh, socially reproductive jobs, uh, as the pandemic has made uh, crystal uh, clear. Um, but on the other hand, uh, even though uh, 
we live in a system that badly needs these jobs. On the other hand, these jobs have tended historically to be uh, stigmatized, to be badly paid, and uh, for decades they were not even considered as jobs. Uh, just uh, think of uh, housework, that is uh, social reproduction, uh, pure and simple, but for uh, for decades it was not even considered work at all. Uh, it was considered just women's uh, women's work, uh, and in that sense, non-productive, uh, uh, not producing value, not re not really um, useful, if not in fact for uh, for housemaking. And only in the last, uh, I would say, maybe 30, 40 years, uh, thanks to the work of, and I mean the decades of work of feminists. Uh, uh, as has been recognized, in fact, as properly work, and even as productive work, according, according to some. So I think um, what is interesting for me about uh, uh, social reproductive work is precisely the contradiction uh, at which it stands uh, with capitalism and with this system. So the, the contradiction, as I said, is because capitalism needs it, but then undervalues it and stigmatizes it, and it uh, um, it also usually tends to uh, give these jobs, or at least uh, usually those people who tend to do these jobs the most uh, are precisely those people that uh, are uh, usually um, undervalued uh, under this system. So women, uh, but also racialized people. That's also why we see uh, a large proportion of uh, uh, for instance, migrant workers or racialized workers and feminized workers uh, among the socially reproductive uh, workers. But what is interesting about this contradiction is also, uh, for me at least, the way in which it also enables us to see an alternative way of organizing societies. Because these uh, are jobs that are not just necessary for capitalism, these are jobs that are necessary for life. These are the jobs uh, and the professions and the skills that are necessary to reproduce life, to maintain life, uh, to reproduce our societies more generally. And uh, it, it's, I always think that uh, it would be possible uh, to rethink, to reorganize and to reimagine these jobs uh, in, a, in another way, uh, which would also lead us to think of uh, an alternative uh, uh, way, really, of organizing our lives and our societies. Maybe I will just, uh, just to conclude, I don't know how much I've spoken for, but if I have a couple of minutes, uh, I will also uh, maybe try to refer to um, some of the work that I've been doing more recently, also to give you the sense in which, uh, uh, for me at least, uh, these jobs are so much in contradiction with, uh, uh, with uh, the capitalist way of organizing societies. And I will refer um, to care work. So uh, mo I've always, uh, in the last 13 years uh, since my PhD really, I've worked on uh, um, migrant care workers, in particular in Europe, uh, domestic workers, but also child, child carers and, and, elderly, and, and elderly workers. And um, in a context such as Italy, which is where I come from, many of this work is by, uh, done by migrant, migrant women is informal, is uh, usually done uh, within households. So there are many, many uh, migrant women uh, in Italy and not only, it's really a Southern European phenomenon that uh, uh, are usually employed by, by individual households to do all uh, kind of caring jobs. And it's become especially a way of uh, um, supplying for uh, the, the lack of the welfare state, particularly in the case of elderly care. But uh, going to Northern Europe and living in Northern Europe now, it's increasingly clear, and this is becoming again quite uh, uh, widespread, uh, I would say, in the Western world, but also in, in Southern Europe more and more, this, this phenomenon of care commodification and care marketization is not new at all. It's been going on uh, since the 1990s at least, uh, but it's uh, quite intensified in the last in in the last 10 15 years and what this has meant 
increasingly is that uh, uh, care work, and here I'm thinking especially of uh, childcare and elderly care, has been increasingly um, uh, made into profit-making work uh, through processes of privatization and marketization uh, in a way in a way that, for instance, increasingly um, corporate players uh, and uh, big, large companies, large chains uh, are investing in this type of work. Now, what's interesting here uh, to think about, I think, is the way in which, uh, on the one hand, uh, this is really work uh, that uh, for decades really has not been valorized or valued uh, precisely because it's not work that uh, was considered to be profit making. Uh, it was, it could aid in profit making, but not uh, enable profit profit making directly. This is kind of shifting under neoliberalism uh, in particular, and that's precisly because uh, it's a, a, a very interesting societal phenomenon. It's pre precisely because uh, with women increasingly uh, working and uh, with uh, uh, dual income families now being increasingly the reality, there has been a huge demand, uh, especially for childcare and elderly care. And obviously the, uh, the, uh, the um, aging of the population has also um, made this demand grow more and more. But still, even in a context such as this, in which these jobs are so badly needed again, and in which they are even enabling profit making, because these large companies, they constantly complain and they say, we need more money from the state and from the government, we're not making profits, etc., which everyone knows is not true. But nonetheless, even in a context in which there is profit making in this, in this care, social reproductive sector. Nonetheless, the jobs are still incredibly low paid, is even considered to be the lowest paid profession in the UK at the moment. The essential workers we were, we were talking about, uh, still feminized and still racialized. Uh, at, there is a, a large um, uh, in fact, the majority of these workers are women, and there is also a large proportion of these workers who come from racialized communities. So this is to say, um, I think it's interesting to look at these contradictions that uh, we can, uh, uh, with which we can work when we look at social reproduction. And uh, to just remember that uh, we have also to work through those contradictions, uh, I think, to reimagine this kind of work in, in, in other ways. I'll close it here. Thank you very much, Sarah, also for your contribution. Really uh, interesting and important. And I think it's really interesting for us to bring your three presentations into dialogue with each other. But in order to do that, I will actually pass now to Rachel, who's been monitoring the chat box to, uh, to bring together questions, comments, um, from everybody. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just pass to you, Rachel, if that's okay. Super. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks so much to the speakers for really fascinating presentations. Just to say again, if you have comments or questions, please do put them in the chat and I will be sharing them with the speakers. If you'd like your question to be directed to one of the speakers, you can also write that in, in the chat box. Um, so we've got one question now from Jay Mitra, which is to all of the speakers. Jay comments, the notion of the hostile environment is a corollary of the idea of fragility, generally associated with countries of origin of migrants. The former is the materialization of institutional antipathy, antipathy, um, antipathy pardon me, deeply entrenched in colonial thought and practice. Do the speakers or anyone else agree? So I'll just ask Yasmin if you'd like to start. Thank you. But you, let me help you. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a really good question. And for me, there's a real paradox in that. And I was struck today, so people would have heard on the news that Moderna have now come up with uh, a, possibly a much better vaccine um, for COVID. And I think there's in some ways, it's an uneven fragility. So in terms of democracy, for example, some um, countries in the 
uh, global north for in the global south are seen as fragile and in need of development in that sort of way. But I'll be really interested to see how this fragility is interpreted in relation to need for things like access to the to the vaccines and what the Lancet is called, you know, vaccine nationalism. So I don't know if people know, but there's these advance um, purchase agreements. So I think there's about three or four countries that have, you know, bought up <laughs> uh, in advance a lot of the, the COVID-19 vaccines. So there's going to be a sense in which I don't think that fragility actually works out in terms of a redistribution of resources. So six, six countries in the world own 90% of morphine supplies. So if you think about pain relief, um, for example, and you think of global circuits of care as they flow in terms of you know, actual resources, I think that notion of fragility is a really... Um, paradoxical one. Thanks, Yasmin. Would either of the other speakers like to come in on this? Sarah? Gwyneth? I mean, just sort of very quickly, uh, I think, and relating a lot to what uh, Yasmin said, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the concept of reproductive justice was developed um, after US women of color had met uh, feminists from the global south at the Cairo Population Conference. And I think that also really uh, highlights the way that like fragility is sort of um, given and taken, taken away that so much um, of the experiment, like so much, so many tests, so much testing of new birth control technologies and whatnot and new drugs is done in the global south. So we're saying it's fragile until such time as uh, we need uh, people in the global south to test out these new technologies before they can be used in, in Western countries and all of a sudden we're the ones who are fragile. Um, Thanks, Gwyneth. Um, Sarah, did you want to come in on this one or? Sh yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Yes. Um, oh, you can hear me. Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, I agree with what uh, uh, Yasmin and Gwyneth already said, but maybe I. Um, more than fragility, I think that the hostile environment is a corollary of, of the idea of, uh, um, I mean, that, it, that it's not really fragility that it comes to my mind here, it's more really the antipathy that uh, uh, Jay Mitra refers to. I mean, it's hostile uh, to certain populations, to certain, uh, to certain people. So in that sense, uh, um, I just wanted to say, I'm not sure that here um, the fragility is uh, what I think the hostile environment is, uh, um, is addressed to, if I understand also the point, uh, the point correctly. But is the, really this idea that there are people from certain populations uh, and certain categories of migrants uh, that are unwelcome precisely because they belong to those populations and to those categories. And actually they are a threat. So in that sense, I'm not, maybe I'd see the opposite of fragility. I think that much of the hostile environment uh, narrative is premised upon the idea that these people can be a threat. Men are depicted as a sexual threat. Uh, women can be depicted as a depending uh, as a, a threat to the welfare state when they are depicted as welfare parasites uh, or Muslim women wearing a, a veil can be even depicted as a threat because of the, the fear of terrorism and so forth. So yeah, I'm just uh, not sure fragility here is what comes to my mind. In fact, I think 
Peter Kehoe in the discussion has raised a sort of similar kind of point that it's about, uh, he's suggesting that um, it says something about whose bodies are seen as fragile and whose bodies are seen as real or a threat even. Um, so, so that the fragility isn't evenly distributed um, across di different bodies. Um, moving to the next, uh, next question, uh, Martina Tazioli has a question for you, Sarah. Um, do you think we can expand reflections on unpaid labor and the definition of it in the field of refugee and migration to include the ways in which refugees and migrants are pushed to volunteer as well as to participate in their own governmentality, kind of a detention from below for, by producing knowledge about their coping strategies, for example? Thanks, Martina. Hi, Martina, actually, <laughs> a colleague also from Goldsmiths. Um, now, this is really very, very interesting. And uh, yes, I definitely think that this reflection on unpaid labor and social reproduction should also include volunteer labor by refugees and migrants. And in fact, uh, I have actually uh, done a little bit of research on that myself because I, when I was uh, working on, uh, uh, on my work on female nationalism, uh, and I was trying to look at the ways in which uh, these uh, uh, constructions of uh, migrant women and especially Muslim women as uh, uh, victims that need to be saved. Uh, um, in, in that context, actually, I realized that in, uh, in several countries, uh, what happens is that many of these migrant women and especially Muslim women, I think of countries like uh, um, like Holland, for instance, they these women have to do lots of volunteer work uh, in order to demonstrate their willingness to integrate into their hosting societies and in order also to gain uh, what they call a professional experience or a professional portfolio that will enable them to find a paid job. So there is a, a, an extensive and a completely ideological use of volunteer labor by migrants. I don't know much about the refugees, but certainly also by migrants and especially migrant women in this context. Thanks, sir. Um, Yasmin or Gwyneth, did you want to come in on that point? Uh, Yasmin, yeah. Um, I think that's a, a, a real question in terms of us as researchers as well. So one thing that I've been very concerned about is that a kind of very um, enlightenment notion of research is about revealing you know, and I think a real ethical question for us is how much we also get in the way of migrant stories in relation to things like how they, how people survive. And that must also be something we take really seriously. So this, what's important for me is the stories we don't tell, the stories we withhold, and the stories we, we might um, subvert in in some way it we might use in ways to subvert that surveillance and appropriation of, of um, strategies of survival thanks Yasmin I think that also co connects very much into some of the work around refusal so Audrey Simpson's work for example about what is it that we refuse whom do we refuse as researchers and, and how we can heed the calls of those we are researching about and with uh, to, to refuse to have their stories exposed. Um, Gwyneth, this is a question for you from Shanna Almeida. Um, Shanna says, I'm wondering if there's a point when migrant mothers become sufficiently responsible in neoliberal terms. I see insufficiently responsible as always already being racially determined. I'm wondering if there are some exceptional cases, so to speak. Well, thank you very much for the question. I would completely agree that uh, insufficiently responsible is racially determined. Uh, and I think there, in, if you look at a lot of the um, 
immigration controls and the disciplining of migrant mothers are often is two facets to it, which work together, which is a sort of classically neoliberal facet of are you earning enough money to be considered a good future citizen? Are you earning enough money to have a child? But there's also a heavily racialized aspect around like English language uh, acquisition, for example. And I think a really great example of this is when David Cameron announced that after years of massive cuts to ESOL budgets, they were suddenly going to put some money into ESOL so that uh, Muslim migrants could raise their children to not be terrorists, which was like obviously an incredibly racist uh, policy. Um, but like they don't necessarily work together depending on who the migrant is. I myself am an immigrant. And I think I could one day be seen as sufficiently responsible. I have ILR, um, I could one day get citizenship. And as a white Canadian, uh, which I think is like an incredibly privileged uh, person to be in this context, like even Nigel Farage probably doesn't have a problem with white Canadians. Um, then yeah, like I think I, I could be responsible, but I do think that uh, racialized migrants uh, will never like, would possibly never be sufficiently responsible. And like Raminda Bambra has written a lot about how during the Brexit debates and afterwards, the conflation of migrant and person from racialized group, regardless of that person's citizenship or how many generations their family have been in the UK. And I think that is one really important aspect of the racialization of British citizenship. Thanks very much, Gwen. Uh, Yasmin or Sarah, did you want to come in on that point? Okay, um, so moving on to a question for Sarah from Katerina Mazzili. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting people's names wrong here. Um, so Katerina asks, um, or comments, you spoke about the importance of low skilled jobs coming to light during the pandemic. Still the UK's, per, UK's preferred system for the post-exit period seems to be a points-based one. Could you comment on this please? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think the the, the UK government uh, uh, definitely still uh, uh, is very attached, like uh, uh, to a to, to a certain definition of low skill and high skill jobs. Uh, this is uh, a useful one in many ways for um, for these governments, precisely because it enables them. Uh, uh, to make, uh, uh, to, to classify uh, certain categories of workers and migrants uh, uh, according to, 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 to a set of, uh, uh, of skills. Uh, and uh, it, I mean, in the end, I really follow Alessandro De Giorgi, who is um, uh, an Italian American criminologist here, who always talks about uh, migration movements as uh, uh, as labor movements primarily, and the ways in which borders are simultaneously uh, and and very often contradictorily uh, erected at one time uh, and uh, they, they come down at other times. Uh, it entirely depends on the specific demands, on the economic demands. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, also the political demands uh, increasingly at, in certain periods. So I would say that uh, for sure the UK still prefers to go through a system in which uh, especially low skilled workers can still be um, regularized in this way, uh, paid little, considered to be as expendable. And in that sense, that is not going to change uh, because of the pandemic, I think. It's been already shown that Boris Johnson, for instance, even though he was, he says he had, uh, he had his life saved by migrant uh, nurses, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, he was uh, still going ahead with uh, charging uh, migrant nurses with these high fees. So it was, it's totally hypocritical, but that's also what uh, uh, in a way we could expect from this type of government. So I don't think that the pandemic in that sense has changed uh, the perception of low skilled work. I think it has changed it uh, for us, <laughs> for uh, in the sense for critical thinkers, uh, but certainly not uh, for the, the UK government. 
and uh, it still remains a useful device for um, uh, for um, managing uh, labor and migration. Jasmine, Gwyneth. So moving on to the next question, um, this is from Shahira Mosley. Um, so it's a two part question. Do you think the failure in integration policies fosters the hostile environment? Is one of the reasons behind this hostility the so-called suppression of far right voice? This is a question for all the speakers. Gwyneth, do you want to start? Uh, basically, no. I think if anything, I mean, I don't know what we mean by integration policies, but in terms of supporting people in building a home and feeling a home and making feeling at home and making social connections in the UK, the hostile environment clearly is completely does the opposite of that. Uh, when the infamous go home bands were being circulated, you had people who'd been here since the 70s saying it reminded them of being attacked by the National Front. Uh, and I think it's ridiculous to say, frankly, that the far right voice is suppressed in the UK when the far right voice is everywhere. It's in the home office. It's in most of the media. So yeah, no. Yeah, um, in some ways I'd be quite interested in, in unpicking some of this further because I think there's some real kind of myths and faulty glitches in the sort of associations. So if we think about when the hostile environment first appeared in policy as a term was when Theresa May was um, Home Secretary, you know, and she wanted to, and it was very much linked to inverted commas, you know, um, creating an environment for those who are considered illegal migrants that would make it very difficult for them to survive in the UK. Um, so that was the term, the, the conditions in which that term and that policy was birthed. At the same time as one of the researchers from the Mapping Immigration Controversy who monitored Operation Vacan and the Go Home Vans, what we found out was that that policy was not based on any empirical research, but it was based on an assumption that it was, we called it a performative politics, drawing on the work of Shireen Rai. So dr driving two vans with huge billboards saying go home or face arrest through six of London's most multicultural boroughs was a speech act in many ways where the government tried to show its right wing voters and also to to you know speak to UKIP's can uh, UKIP voters that it had control of um, immigration policies and it was coming down hard. The other thing I want to say is that thanks to the work of campaigners and also Amelia Gentleman, what we've seen in terms of the last few years and the Windrush um, so-called scandal is how the hostile environment has been a creeping disentitlement. So you can stay in place, you can be a long-term British citizen and the border moves underneath you. So we're in the era of, the, of mobile and molten borders. And I think that's one of the real things about the hostile environment. You know, I was one of the um, researchers who interviewed people from the far right party, the British, you know, the British National Party and UKIP when we were doing the go home vans research. And it was really interesting how the differential racialization at play. So UKIP voters were saying to me, well, those who came over in the 50s and 60s, i.e like my parents and Caribbean people, they were good deserving migrants. And they were actually upset by the more recent, predominantly Eastern European migrants and others who were coming in and not working so hard. So I think there's a real complexity in differential racialization, but also what we've seen in terms of Windrush, which is people, again, in terms of slow violence, being, you know, losing their jobs, losing their homes, being denied life-saving treatment, and also this, you know, the hostile environment, Dexter, Bristol, 
in in 2018 you know that the um case his case they refused to hold the home office account to account for his death and yet his mother was saying he was under such extreme extreme stress that he actually died in the street that is the reality of the hostile environment i tried to stay calm <laughs> Thanks, Yasmin. Sarah, did you want to come in on this point? You can't, let me try and help you unmute. Yeah, no, yeah. now it works, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree um, with what Winneth and Yasmin just said. So just uh, maybe to, to add that uh, it's been quite a narrative uh, Again, the last 10 years, uh, this idea that uh, the hostile environment in the UK or tougher uh, immigration controls in other countries in Europe, because we have different editions of the hostile environment across Europe. So, but anyway, the, the, the line has been everywhere, a tougher line on immigration. And the idea that uh, this was due to a kind of failure in integration policies or the failure of, of multiculturalism, as it was called at some point, was always this, there, there was this kind of narrative, right? The idea that uh, we had these uh, terrorist, attempt, terrorist attacks because these children were not properly educated by proper uh, monogamous families, but it was because they came from often anomic or polygamous families, so they, they couldn't properly behave. Now, there were these kind of narratives and uh, obviously they all don't make absolutely any sense um, because, uh, well, first of all, precisely this hostile environment in the UK, but more generally the tougher line on immigration really in many ways was uh, was based that uh, came after the, um, uh, the huge global financial crisis. And uh, it was in a way the political response also to that, uh, uh, to that crisis. But it's not just that, obviously. It's also uh, in the end, the rise of the right uh, globally, but also, uh, and, and especially in some ways in Europe, uh, that has led to this uh, line on immigration justified, though on the basis of uh, this idea of uh, uh, failed integration, which is not sustainable in any, in any way. Thanks very much to all the speakers for that. I, I wanted to come back. I mentioned Peter Kehoe's uh, comment about which bodies are seen as real, fragile, or a threat. But I, I missed the question. Sorry, Peter. He said he's to all of the speakers, he's interested in your thoughts about vaccination policies in relation to key workers, that NHS employees are in line for the vaccine, but the not the agency employed care staff um, or cleaning staff and so forth. Um, can, can you, would you like to come in on that point? This is for all the speakers. So if anybody would like to comment about vaccination policies. Sarah, thank you. Well, I don't know exactly uh, why that is the case. Uh, I am tempted to say that it could just be incompetence uh, because uh, this government has already showed so much of that. So I wouldn't be surprised if they just didn't, uh, you know, make uh, that type of, uh, you know, uh, logical, um, uh, uh, yeah, the reflection on the, on the need also for agency employed care staff to be vaccinated. Um, I, I don't know exactly what's behind that, but I'm just, if what you mean uh, is that maybe those agency employed staff uh, usually care for, uh, usually they are employed more in care homes uh, for elderly people, and there is a certain idea that there is less need for that there, that I don't know. I don't know if this, this is what you meant, but I really wonder if it's just a plain incompetence here.
Yasmin or Gwyneth, did you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, I'm also not sure about um, how this will play out in practice. But I mean, just in terms of thinking about who are agency staff, they're, you know, on some of the most precarious working conditions. Um, and also there are hierarchies within the NHS itself, which I think we've been seeing, you know, but particularly in terms of thinking very practically about the different levels of exposure, what we found out during the pandemic was that cleaning staff, so actually changing a bed in which a COVID patient was in, was an extremely dangerous position. So the doctors and nurses were given PPE, but actually taking a sheet off, you know, and having viral sort of um, clouds around you made those workers, so the people who are cleaning, really, really susceptible, more susceptible to infection by the virus. So, um, as Sarah said, I think there this could be incompetence, but I also wonder if there is that sense. So, my understanding is it that those who are agency staff are predominantly also um, in socially marginalised groups, and I wonder if this is because, for example, they're not unionised. Lots of them aren't, so they, you know, they haven't had an input into these policies. But um, yeah, I'd be interested to see whether this actually is implemented. I suspect not. Beth, did you want to add to that discussion? No. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to um, move on to uh, the next question, which is uh, from Jay Mitra again. Um, so Jay comments, and this is for all speakers. The architect for the idea of the hostile environment was David Blunkett when he was Home Secretary for Labour. This implicit collusion between the left and right is again a legacy of hostility to natives during colonial times, supported by both the left and the right. What do speakers think about the right marriage of hostile environment propagators? Would anybody be? Yeah, I think um, what's quite depressing is um, how, how labor, you know, from I guess, 2013, particularly in terms of thinking about the um, implementation, the over implementation of hostile environment policies was really um, complicit, I think, of managing in terms of trying to manage its um, image of also being a party who could be tough on immigration. Um, and I think this, yeah, that we, we, there wasn't a strong response um, in terms of, you know, coming out against the hostile environment. And I think that leaves us in a very um, vulnerable position now in terms of thinking about the political future and the way forward. Because at the moment, we are living at a time when to, you know, be a loyal British citizen is to be anti-migrant. You know, I've, just in terms of doing empirical research, that those are the terms of belonging now. And I think there's lots of political work that needs to be done to um, reconfigure that sort of narrative and that demand. So yeah, those, those are my thinking, that's my thinking, but I do agree there's been this really um, horrible, nasty <laughs> alliance between the left and right in terms of not actually being coming out strongly as being pro, all migrants so not the certain you know not the brain surgeons and all the people um, uh, that we might have wanted at, at different points in time uh, Gwyneth yeah I just agree with everything uh, Yasmin has said and that it's worth I mean, I guess whether or not you consider David Blunkett to be left wing is a matter of personal opinion, but there is 
like labor has ne almost never been good on migration. It was Harold Wilson who passed the 1968 uh, Commonwealth Immigrants Act. Uh, his statue is like a mile from, from where I live. Uh, there's a long, there are long, labor has long been hostile to migrants. And when the conservatives have been in charge uh, and labor has been in opposition, they really rarely challenged these ideas. And um, we are seeing uh, increasingly the idea that in order to win back the so-called like red wall, uh, the Northern towns that voted conservative in the last election, that labor has to uh, once again, take uh, an explicitly xenophobic stance. Uh, what's interesting about this to me as someone who lives in the North of England is also the view of the North of England as a like, completely white homogenous place, which is very much not the case at all. Sarah, did you want to come in on this point? Well, I completely agree with what uh, is being said already. Uh, what is uh, really depressing for me as well, as Yasmin was, was saying, is how these uh, politics, uh, the left-wing politics of uh, um, somehow going after the right and justifying that on the basis at that, uh, um, you know, people are racist, uh, they don't want migrants, uh, so we have to uh, to do that because otherwise we lose voters. Uh, so this kind of ca catching up, uh, catching the right uh, um, politics uh, is uh, has been defeated. In fact, it doesn't really work because when society becomes more right-wing and more anti-immigration, uh, actually are the right-wing parties and not the Labour Party or the more left-leaning parties that are going to be, uh, that are going to get the votes. So when you turn a society into a more right-wing, xenophobic society, the left is not going to uh, actually to benefit from that. So it's doubly depressing because it's also self-defeating. Thanks very much to all of the speakers. Oh, sorry, Yasmin, were you trying to say something more? Um, I just wanted to say as well, I'd really particularly like to encourage questions or reflections from black and women of color who are here today. Um, so yeah, let's take away some of the, the space and time from others. And like I always find when I go to events as well, it can be quite hard to speak, but I would love to hear from you and I'm sure everybody else would as well if there's time. Um, okay, so why don't we take this last um, comment as a, as a stepping off point for all of the speakers to make a kind of closing closing response to this statement. So this is from um, Fatan Kaza, um, who says, I think the classical works of feminists criticizing Marxist theorists on the way they ignored that the economic power relations were inherently gendered and made possible with the association of capitalism and patriarchy, but also Stuart Hall's demonstration of how race and slavery was also very, was also very inherently related to capitalism. So totally agree that the right-left distinction lacks the critical analysis of the necessary alliance of racism, capitalism, and sexism to the governance of migration or any other so-called social problems. So I'd just like to invite, uh, we've got five minutes left, so just all invite all of the speakers to, if you wanted to make a last kind of response to, to this, this point from Fatah and Kaza. or of course invite further comments from 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 the audience as as Yasmin has if that's would any of the speakers like to end here
Sarah. Really very briefly, just to say I completely agree um, with Faten. And if I understand also her comment correctly, I think it is, um, I think it's also uh, true a very welcome the, the way in which uh, Marxist and socialist feminists uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, have increasingly made uh, and very strongly made this point, uh, which is that uh, we really do not accept uh, anymore to consider uh, race and gender or racism and sexism uh, as uh, kind of secondary contradictions uh, which was the usual language of many orthodox Marxists in the past, but that in fact, we need to understand the complexity and the ways in which they are absolutely necessary to, cap to capitalism, uh, in which, uh, in fact, as Faten says, uh, these alliance of racism, capitalism, and sexism is essential for the governance of migration, but in general for the, the maintenance of the system. So I think uh, I think this is becoming uh, um, more and more. I, I can see an awareness, uh, for instance, in my students, uh, but also in colleagues, uh, uh, comrades, uh, and uh, um, really people around me coming from these traditions of how essential it is to develop uh, these uh, uh, this this line of reasoning and this understanding further. Yasmin or Gwyneth? Just indicate to me if you'd like to, to comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, that's, that's absolutely right, as, as Sarah said, to um, agree with the importance of a intersectional analysis. Um, I guess, for me also that it's, we're sort of in, I feel I'm always in this period of double think at the moment. And I just wanted to acknowledge as well, the hostile environment in terms of universities and particularly what's happening at UEL, um, the University of East London. So it feels really important that some of the pioneers of this work are also the ones who are really being threatened at the moment and who are being excluded from our knowledge making and the academy. Um, so save all those jobs at um, the University of East London is my final comment. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And just to say that the next um, Sam webinar that we'll be holding as social scientists against the hostile environment is exactly about the, uh, the pandemic, hostile environment, and higher education. And the, the, obviously, the case at UEL is one of the ones that in which many of our members are being affected. And, and so it will be, I think, a kind of core focus of the discussion. I, I, I'm saying this now, but I think it will, it will obviously be one of the one of the things that comes up as part of that discussion. Gwyneth, just to give you a chance for a last comment before we we, we close the seminar. I, I don't think I necessarily have anything really constructive or interesting to add. So thank you though. Great. Um, so thank you very much everyone for joining us for this um, Social Scientist Against the Hostile Environment webinar. I think it's been a really interesting discussion about the ways in which social social reproduction theory can help us understand what Yasmin referred to as life support, as sustenance, as, as reproduction, about the ways in which um, migrants are, are deeply involved and, and necessary for the societies that they live in, but they're also excluded, so through reproductive injustice, subjected to forms of slow violence through bodily loss, through weathering away. Um, and I think all of the speakers really uh, highlighted or hinted at the productivity of these sorts of frames of analysis in terms of rethinking some of the pro-migrant pro uh, politics that, that um, social scientists against the hostile environment certainly um, holds, holds on to. So thank you very much for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next uh, seminar, which as I said, will be about higher education and more news will be uh, circulated shortly. 
Thank you all. And thank you especially to our speakers, Yasmin, Gwyneth, and Sarah. Thank you very much to the speakers and uh, Rachel. Thank you to everyone for their really incisive, important questions. Um, I think the date, do we have a date for the next seminar? No. Okay. Great. Thank you.